Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate International Women's Day, but also the end of our first edit-a-thon at YWCA Canada. My name is Rebecca Pacheco, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Projects and Communication Coordinator at YWCA Canada. YWC Canada's national office is located on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. To Toronto, also known as Toronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I would like to remind us today as we gather on an online space that the digital space is often used as a tool of oppression against Indigenous women, racialized women, women of varying abilities, of gender and sexual orientations. And so we would like to move through this session today in a spirit of decolonizing, being inclusive in truth and reconciliation, and we invite you to join us in that as well. And today we are so lucky to be joined by Simona Ramkinson. Simona Ramkinson is, is a Toronto-based community advocate and has found a unique home in the tech sector, working as the manager of community development at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the operator of Wikipedia. Her current work focuses on developing learning and leadership development opportunities for volunteer contributors who support open Wikimedia projects and leading organization, organizing efforts in global communities. Um, Simona frequently works with local organizations to develop scalable community-based programming that supports inclusive technology, such as digital literacy and online privacy for, uh, and security for black, indigenous and people, and people of color. So thank you so much for taking the time today, Simona, for chatting with me. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity for us to connect and have this conversation. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, yay. Okay, so as I mentioned today, we are actually ending our first ever edit-a-thon at YWCA Canada, which is really exciting and That's really crazy. Amazing. And I'm so happy to be to be here and supporting um, an amazing project that is generating content about fantastic women and non-binary non folks. Um, and yes. that is definitely needed. Oh, yeah. So as part of our project, so it's actually part of YWCA 150 Look Back, Push Forward. Over the last about three weeks now, um, people from across this country have come together to edit and create pages uh, on Wikipedia to highlight women, gender diverse folks, as well as organizations and events that have been what we're calling these change makers in Canadian history pertaining to a bunch of things, but really um, focusing on the progression of gender equity, women's rights in the history uh, of in Canadian history. And we have seen some incredible edits and pages that were created as part of this event. And this was really, it was our first time doing an event like this. And we really weren't sure what the uptake or what it was going to be like, but like now seeing the numbers of how much our community was able to achieve all online without us being able to like sit in a room together has been like astonishing for me. And I find myself like constantly refreshing to see like, and every time the number changes, I like do like a little happy dance because, and nobody sees me because I'm behind my computer, but it's so exciting to see in real time, like all of these edits come through as part of this event that we've had and we've never done again, something like this before. Um, and so in closing this three week long event, um, not only is it International Women's Day, which is like my favorite day of the year, hey. uh, <laughs> it's the best, but we also get to celebrate the end of this really, really cool event that we did. And now we get to talk to you who is so involved in this space and there's, I nobody else I'd rather talk to about this topic than someone who's involved in this space. And not only that is working at Wikimedia, like that's, it's meant to be, it's so awesome. Um, so let's, let's jump right in. Um, so tell us about the Wikimedia Foundation and that's where you work and you're the manager of community development. So can you let people know? Because a lot of times we're, we've heard of Wikipedia for sure, but we haven't really heard of Wikimedia. Um, and so can you tell us about their work perhaps? Yeah, really the Wikimedia Foundation um, operates Wikipedia and its other open wiki projects. So a lot of the times I think everybody assumes Wikipedia is, is that, but Wikimedia embraces uh, the idea of free knowledge and access to it, right? So um, it's knowledge is just not the written word, it's data, it's, it's um, sources, it's you know, other content that actually is kind of creating that holistic um, 
picture and access of, of what knowledge is um, and the diversity that it is. Um, my role in community development is actually looking at those contributors, the volunteers, the people who have decided that they care about free knowledge, they care about access to information and knowledge, um, and they care about that it's, it's credited and it's sourced and then and, and it's accurate. Um, so I work with, our team works with this, these, these volunteers from all over the world to really kind of help them um, plan and figure out how do they take their work to the next level or how do they get more people from their communities and from their language communities, their thematic interest communities, um, and how do we get them to, to contribute? How do we support them in their contributions? And then also, how do we keep them safe? Um, because in so many places around the world, the idea of accessing knowledge um, is potentially dangerous and life-threatening. Um, so we actually have to look at knowledge is not just the content piece, but actually looking at the people who, who um, who are spending their time um, mm -hmm. to, to, to contribute to this movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that looks like uh, learning and development. So how do we get them to have plan better programming? How do we get them to, to recognize where those content gaps are? And then how do we support that or support them in, in filling those gaps? And then also how do we um, get people who have never experienced Wikipedia or experienced any type of open contribution? So the idea that you're not just consuming something, that you're actually actively um, contributing content, citing sources, um, advocating for more, more representation on the platforms. Um, so looking at and working at those folks and figuring out how best to support them and then and then doing it and then bringing and then also how do we support these communities of practice so getting people talking to each other so just because you're in Santiago Chile doesn't mean we can't learn someone from um, you know Lagos Nigeria can't learn from you so like how do we also connect together um, is a really big part of the work that our team does. I love that. And it really is this like global, and I, sometimes I think I know it, that gets lost on me, but it's available in so many different languages and um, so many people, so many different people around the world access this information. And so you're really contributing to a platform that's going to be used around the world, which is, it's wild. It's, it's crazy, but really cool. Um, maybe too, I was going to ask if you could speak to your background that you mentioned it like I think that would be cool because I know I keep looking at like all the different little pictures and everyone is like I feel like has its own little story. So maybe you can let everyone who's watching know like what's going on. So Wikipedia uh, turned 20 years old uh, this year so. Um... So this background um, and I'm, I'm trying not to be really weird with it kind of <laughs> represents. Um, I think that I love this background because it represents, I think, the diversity of the movement. Um, the fact that, you know, you have, um, I can't really see just different, different actors and activists um, coming together and, and kind of using Wikipedia as this tool, not just a platform, not just a hobby for some, but an actual tool for justice, for, for equity. Um, so it represents kind of different things. You have the WWW. So 20 years ago, the internet was not the internet that we have today, right? So um, Wikipedia was existing in a space that was also developing itself. Um, I think we have, um, I think we have Frida Kahlo behind me and I'm like, <laughs> hard. like trying to do this. Yeah. But it's also, um, it also uh, it includes just phenomenal women, um, trans activists, who have also kind of contributed to, to that representation on the platform. So um, to, to be supporting a project that is 20 years old um, and it's, it's a free project, anybody can contribute. Um, we kind of wanted to capture that, mm -hmm. that, that color, I think, um, yeah, and beautiful. that view from that kind of global lens um, mm -hmm. in our backgrounds. Yeah, the yeah. colors, it's just so vibrant. And like, again, you want to look at all of them individually and then collectively, it's like this beautiful um, thing that like, again, in art is beautiful in that way that it can represent something um, so well. So I find myself just- I know, I'm like, I hope I'm not distracting everybody. No, but no, no, it's, it's like, it's adding to the whole experience. <laughs> I really like and that mention also of these online spaces and Wikipedia being used as a tool that it is this like use in towards our action. Um, 
and we can leverage that and use these in, and use that information in these platforms in our spaces. So that's definitely a theme and a concept I definitely want to come back to for sure. Um, and moving forward, so you've I know you've participated and you've led projects that focus on the importance of digital literacy, um, particularly for youth as well. And so can you maybe talk to your work in that space or even digital literacy in general and its importance? Yeah. Um... I was introduced to the concept of digital literacy about seven, no, eight years ago uh, when I started working with a small um, not-for-profit who was looking at the, the technological, like the technical careers pipeline. So, you know, who, who is going to be taking on these evolving digital careers um, and recognizing that there was li like very limited diversity in that in that pipeline, right? So, um, the idea that uh, you know for you to take on a role that at the time didn't exist, right? So we're talking about um, you know we we were starting to see uh, digital like social media um, roles. We were starting to see technical design roles. We were starting to see UX roles. We were seeing you know, and then you were starting to think, well, who is ready? Who's prepared to take on these roles? And when you look at the data, alarmingly, and I'm going to say alarmingly, is that it, it's, you know, they, you tended to not be um, a person of color. You tended not to be a woman. You tended to be a man. You, you tended to be white and you tended to be someone with access to, to higher education. But more importantly, you were someone who had technology in the home at an earlier age or at an earlier time or had more opportunity to engage with it. So building those, the idea of those, those kind of literacy skills. And so my, the role I had at the organization was like bringing in these tech speakers as these role models into schools to kind of introduce communities that tended to look like me, young people of color, women or girls or non-binary or non-gendered individuals, um, and then introduce them to these ideas. And then um, hopefully that that would spark an interest for them to pursue those roles. But as I started to learn more about digital literacy and what it really was, it wasn't just how we use technology. It's just not how we get online, but it's how we make decisions once we get there. And it's how we understand how to contribute versus how do we, you know, just what we're kind of, all, I, I don't say recommended, but um, I think naturally comes to it is to consume these digital spaces, consume information and not really think critically of, you know, is this where I want to be getting my information from? Is this information relevant? Is this, is, is this place safe for me to exist? And that is digital literacy. It is this idea that we could, that it's this knowledge or understanding that once we get onto these spaces that we have enough um, skill uh, to, to navigate that and build an experience for ourselves, right? And that it's not just kind of take what you get. Yeah. Um, and so with digital literacy and young people, we are working with the, one of the most technologically adaptive um, generations, right? These are young people who have had technology at an earlier age um, and that they, they, they are online consistently, right? It's not just a choice. School is online and COVID has, and the pandemic has shown us that even more school is online, how they engage, you know, how they connect is online. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of the, the narrative around digital literacy is like, well, this is how, learning to code. Yeah. That's just a technical competency of digital literacy. And it's not one that everybody needs or needs to strengthen or build if they don't want to. Um, but what it, I think digital literacy is so important. It also gives us the ability to to then kind of think past what we just consume and then think about what we want to do with that. So what, what if we want to become builders of the next phase of digital spaces? What if we want to be the, the designers of how things look, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then even thinking about AI, especially ethical AI, who is building the things that will impact us most. If we are not supporting young people to build these digital literacy competencies, um, we're actually not helping them um, or they're, they're really not given a chance to, to kind of then evolve into these roles or to pursue these roles. Um, I think digital literacy also, you know, it, if it really is important because in 10 years, the people who are building our spaces, we would hope look like us too, right? So we want that diversity. We want that representation mm -hmm. because we are going to consume these products if we want, if we don't, if we, even if we don't want to. Mm -hmm. They are part of our, our daily lives um, and that 
it's important that it's built, those things are built in a way that, that represent us and our needs, you know, versus kind of one homogenous group building the things, telling us what we need, and then, and really not recognizing that we have, there are differences, there are certain things, and, and access is a big part of digital literacy. Have, you, not all communities, not all people, not all families have it in the home. So it, it becomes pretty challenging when you're thinking about how do you, how do you then, how do you equip this group of people and ensure that they have the tools and resources to, to mm -hmm. cope. So um, my work with young people was really kind of trying to shift that narrative from thinking it's just code and it's just getting online to to recognizing it's it's more about critical thinking, it's more about um, those technical competencies, and it's more about kind of like what experiences are you then given the agency to create for yourself online that keeps you safe, that in, ensures that you get to meet your needs, your needs are met, and also gives you that space to explore. So yeah. Wow, I feel like we need to <laughs> just so take, no, I feel we need to just be able to clip that and just send it everywhere. Like that was so well and succinctly put. Um, and I know I kind of got lost in there in the sense of listening because I just learned and I thought I knew a lot about digital literacy, but the way you put it was so accessible in the sense that it's not just getting on these spaces. And that is step one because accessibility is definitely still an issue. <laughs> But then when you do even just get on these spaces and have access to these spaces, it's the decisions you make once you're there and moving towards like how, how do you do so safely for yourself and digital literacy, a huge part is being able to navigate these spaces and engage in these spaces and keeping yourself safe also and, um, and taking in information critically and not just consuming. Um, but also again in, in contributing and being on those spaces, but also being critical of what's out there. Um, that was wow. I'm like, it's like I, oh my God, speak no speech. Um, that was so well put. Um, thank you. I'm like, eh, kind of wow. Okay, let's move to the next little piece. Um, and this comes back to what we were talking about before, but um, maybe sharing your thoughts about how we can continue to use tech as a social justice tool, that piece being, I think, that key word there. And then what are some examples that maybe you've seen or you've used in your own work or, um, yeah, and that you've seen and that how tech is being leveraged really as this tool in our movements and in our work in social justice fields, I guess. That is an amazing question. Thank you. Um, I think it's, there's so many ways to look at that. I think one, technology has allowed us to know more, right? We have the ability to, to access information about what is going on, looking at multiple lenses, um, now more than ever, I believe. There are more, you know, um, I even just think the concentration of, of information that we're given um, is something that we've, we've hadn't had, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's, it's changed the nature of organizing where more people are aware of what the issues are. More people are aware of, of you know, the, of the impact of some of these challenges. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement um, really has leveraged technology in a way um, and really grounded in it. You know, their social media campaigns were, were impactful and you had more people understanding um understanding that but on the kind of the flip side it also you you were faced with it right when we you see those 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 videos of of you know unarmed black men um uh violently being and violently being targeted and and you you also had more opportunity to, to i think i don't want to say radicalize but i think people could recognize like this is you know it's not good for all of us there is something really challenging and technology has allowed us to also plug in you know where to provide our dollars to support some of these movements um sharing information with loved ones who may have never have had access to it but i also have to i'm also very you know digital security is something i really care about especially digital security and privacy and activists are you know the technology that's used to target activists um, who is doing who are doing this this on the ground work is also pretty tr troubling and but another side of that you know how technology is a part of organizing um, and activism um, and so part of that I think is you know yes we we have the tools and we have people to act our messages we can spread the message more 
But I think, again, that digital literacy piece, privacy and security is also part of digital literacy as well. So, you know, what platforms are you using to communicate? You know, I think we, we, we are recognizing some of the limitations and challenges and surveillance that Google Docs has, and we, you know, from some of the, some of what we've seen in India happening. And I think that you know, I'm not going to sit here and say don't use the technology because that's never a, a line that I will think. I believe in the technology in itself, like that the fact that giving access to it is a good thing. But I do also want to encourage people to be very active about their privacy and security when they're when they are using these tools and evaluating them. Reading the the terms and conditions is important, and I say this because people don't recognize what they give up when they show up to these spaces. Use these tools. Um, the fact that we do give permission to have people surveil our documentation, have people to look through, through you know, because we, it's not on our servers, it's not something that we own and we don't own our data once mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we click yes, even yeah. though we didn't read it, right? So I do think that technology has given us more, given us an ability to, to spread and share our message, share information, build mm -hmm. mutual aid um, through that and grow mutual aid. But that still needs to be balanced. That the technology was not built for these for these purposes, right? So, um, so how do you and balancing that? So, what are you know alternatives? And I know sometimes those privacy and security alternatives are not always the most user friendly. Mm -hmm. But I do encourage people to 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 evaluate them for their needs, mm -hmm. um, and then also look at engaging in digital security and training and, and development to to just to keep ensuring that their 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 work isn't challenged or jeopardized or their themselves are not jeopardized. I think that's such an important point to keep reiterating. And I know I've been there when the terms and conditions are like three pages long and you're like, I'm sure it's fine. Everybody else is on the app. Like I'm sure like everybody else is doing it. Like I'm sure it's fine, but it that no, like it's not. And I think at YWC Canada, for sure, we have engaged in more and more conversations about cyber safety and security and privacy and things like that. And so it's definitely given me a whole new understanding of your online presence and your identity, and it is valuable and your data and your information is valuable. And so it's so important to try and keep that to keep not try to keep that safe as best as you can. Um, and so it's true. It's you want to tech and online spaces and these things are allowing us to connect in a way we never have before um, and to engage in movements and things globally and to interact with people that you really wouldn't otherwise get to without this mm -hmm. without these new tech pieces but it's also being aware as we engage in that to how to keep ourselves safe and to and that's that digital literacy piece that keeps coming up because it is your safety and security mm -hmm. and your online presence is an extension of your offline presence. And exactly. so you're wanting to keep that safe um, because they're they're one and the same there. If so, and it's tough. The tech and things is tough as someone who might not be involved in that world or have that background. It can be scary and long and big words and coding, yeah. things like that. I'm, I'm like, I have no knowledge of that kind of stuff. So I'm like, I don't like I don't know but there's there has to be a way for us to engage in those conversations in a more accessible way um, so that we know how to keep ourselves safe on there because we don't want to be excluded from online spaces especially oh. now that we need to engage in this way because of the pandemic and so how do we get to do that but also keep ourselves safe mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something we have to like keep talking about and keep working on for sure but um that was yeah thank you for that um mm -hmm. the next point i think comes back and we've it's been spoken about but really wanting to like um shine a light on it is that online representation matters in terms of seeing people that look like us on spaces or who have contributed to places that we read or um different platforms that we use and so how do we continue to ensure that our work and our communities and our movements are represented online authentically and accurately um, as we move through these tech spaces? I think the edit-a-thon is a great example of that. The fact that people that you were able to organize and, and get that contribution happening, right? Like I think that is a great, and that's a great example of, of how that representation could look. And I love the fact that balancing that with that safety piece, right? Um, 
I'm not going to sit here and say like, well, Wikipedia is is not doesn't have a cha its challenges. It does, the you know, and it's the same thing that we the same challenges that we see in academia and representation of 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 women and, and non-binary or non-gendered individuals. So I think like I think that just sometimes getting trying is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it's easier to do it with a community and not by yourself. And I love and community is a, just a deep rooted value in, of mine. And some and the editathon is that it's anchored in this idea of why don't we just come together around a kitchen table and just try right and and talk it through. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit here again and say that you know some people will not have a, have issues with an editathon focused on one specific type of content that is looking to be generated. But I I, I also say don't stop keep trying, do not stop. And it can be scary sometimes. And I think that's why when we look at that digital literacy piece, it's also building practices that keep you resilient and keep you safe too. So, you know, I know the first time you may get your, uh, you know, someone may say like, this is, this is, they're not notable enough or they haven't done enough. Mm -hmm. To who? To who is, who gets to decide that? Yeah, I don't think that it should be just, you know, someone who may not understand this, this, this individual understand what their contributions. So, you know, source it, learn how to, to, you know, find those sources, advocate for those sources if, and if, if they're not there, but I don't think that, um, that we, that we should stop. I think we should, we should in, always ensure that we're safe when we're doing, we're always ensuring that we're safe, but also recognizing that someone will now read an article about someone that they may never, they've never heard of before. And that could lead to something different. Uh, we can be putting up an article about, um, a, a, you know, trans activists or non-binary activists for the first time who may have not had, you know, who may have done amazing work, but has not felt notable enough. And like, again, to who, notable to who? And I think thinking about who's gonna read that article and who's going to be, inspired or who's going to want to write the next article right it's sometimes just a chain reaction and sometimes like the i can't tell you how to you know i can tell you a million different ways to organize an edathon mm -hmm. but my my first piece of piece of piece of you know i would recommend is is try um even on wikipedia try doing correcting some articles doing easy edit articles there are many different tools that you can or practices that you can try but just just try and and you know maybe try with the best friend and if that still doesn't work reach out to the community development team at the wikimedia foundation we are always here to, to kind of answer questions on on how to contribute yeah. uh, or where to plug in to contribute but yeah i think my my first and foremost is, is just try um it's important mm -hmm. knowledge that we need um this is not just knowledge for canadians this is the world is watching um and and looking to to see that so I, I think the edit-a-thon and what YWCA is doing is, is a beautiful example of that, mm -hmm. for, for truly and for real. I can't stop smiling because your passion is like radiating. <laughs> Tell that like this is the work that you do and love and like it's just it's so apparent to me and like when I get to hear passionate people talk about what drives them and like what they do it it thrives like it it makes it it's like you transfer that to people um, and that really, oh, so sorry. That really like moves me in a way that I want to keep, I want to keep going. Like I want to try, like I want to do it. I've, I, I said to you before, I've never um, done an edit-a-thon before, never mind host one or plan one or work towards one. And and so I went into this, no knowledge of how to edit Wikipedia or what that meant, how that process would look. I didn't have an account on Wikipedia or anything like that. And so I was really starting this like Googling, like what is an edit-a-thon? Like, how do I do this? And now I'm like, I've become a little tiny part of this like really cool space. Um, and I learned how to edit a page and things like that. And there are so many resources um, as part of our um, event, we partnered with this amazing organization called Art and Feminism, and yep. they do all of this work from an intersectional lens, and they provide all of these free resources to people who want to engage in this type of work in a variety of different languages, um, all for free. And I just sent one email, and now I connect with someone on a weekly basis, and they check in, how's your event going, join our Slack channel, like, 
And so just by sending one email to someone, I was able to create this really cool partnership and connection with someone and then join a Slack channel and like interact with global people, expert Wikipedians, something I didn't even know a role I existed. I was introduced to this world um, and it's incredible. And seeing all the people who register, I can say we have people from across the country who are participating in this event, people of varying age ranges. We go from like late teens, early twenties to late forties, early fifties. Like we have a huge range of people joining us of various genders um, and various knowledge in terms of Wikipedia. We have people who have done many edit-a-thons and people who have never participated in one before. And so it was a great exercise for me to, as someone who hadn't done this before, I was like, what would I need mm -hmm. as if I came into this event knowing nothing? How do I make this welcome to this space? These are the tools that you'll need to engage in it. Um, and so really it is like, try, like I can attest to that now. I had no knowledge of this world. Um, and it was really like, okay, let me try and send one email and it just kind of like snowballed into this like really cool thing that's happened. Um, because representation does matter. You don't know what reading one article for somebody who's never read an article or Googling a name and, the, and something pops up that they can read about that maybe hadn't before. Um, and to think that YWC Canada, me, like anybody could be a part of that. like. So cool. <laughs> like, and that's, and I think one of the things that I, I really just value about Wikimedia and Wikipedia and the, the projects is there are communities around there that want pe more people here and, um, and are interested. So, you know, I think for every time you'll hear a negative story around, you know, someone articles being questioned on, on notability or, you know, things being marked for deletion without, you know, without, um clear or really just kind of feedback that can be useful i think about the thousands of other people who are answering an email for the you know from someone who wants to run their their first edit-a-thon around the world mm -hmm. and the teams that are developing these free resources um because because that is the nature of open it's access and limiting or taking out that barrier that financial barrier is what gets more people on so the idea that there are teams there are groups who are who just want you to try to right and these were groups that tried as well mm -hmm. and sometimes it will it will take you three to four times ten times um to 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 just try mm -hmm. but i think it's it's i think it's such a, a tool or a place in which you you are you know think about the idea that you're contributing to an encyclopedia yeah. you know, i think when you you see an encyclopedia written one you don't know who wrote it you don't know where this information comes from. That's exactly what I would see when I would go to my aunt's house and see all of her Encyclopedia Britannica's on her shelf. And I just thought that was such a cool tool, like this, this book of knowledge yes. and Wikipedia. This, this, it's, oh, who's writing it? It's the community. Well, who, who's telling us it's, it's correct information? They source it, they're citing. Um, they're providing feedback if the source is not strong enough. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, I think it's this, this really cool experiment that what if what if we just all cared about knowledge? What if we all cared about access? And we all know the knowledge is power. So if, if communities who who are marginalized and underrepresented and suppressed have this this public resource, this free resource to talk about their own culture, they talk about their own narratives. That is also that kind of cultural preservation piece, right? Like. It's not just uh, an encyclopedia. I think it's so much more than that too. And if you only want to choose to contribute to it because it is an encyclopedia, amazing. But if you see this as a tool to, to recognize cultures and languages, um, sharing that with the world, that's amazing as well. But I think one of the things that separates, um, you know, not doing something and doing it is that you have the ability to, to you know, correct and edit means you contributed to this page, maybe thousands of people have contributed to. They all cared about it. They all wanted to, to see that happen and it be improved and be a strong article. Mm -hmm. um, I look at what Wikipedia has been able to do with COVID and its relationship with the World Health Organization in which this was a, a resource that anybody could access that would give you up to date um, sourced and cited information about a global pandemic 
where it's a lot, you know, some people may have not had access, some people may have not trusted, you know, the information that they were receiving from, you know, different sources. But the fact that that has also been a place where people have gathered to, to share information and receive it, um, I think that's the, just to me the best definition of, of community, right? Like contributing, supporting, mutual aid, learning together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be us in Canada doing it, you know, there are edit-a-thons happening in, in South Africa. There could be edit-a-thons in, in India. And it's, it, it's, you're part of something, of, I think it's just like you're, you, you're plugged into something. Yeah. That you may not have ever thought that you could have been a part of. Yeah. I, I really, and that's like that, this global piece and that doing this research, I looked into events that were happening around the world at the same time. And to think that like, we're in different spaces, we're in different rooms, like we're not able to meet together in one room, even across this huge country that we live in, like that I am working on something together with somebody in like across the country at their computer in at their desk and that we're collectively working on something. It's just like, it's wild to me to think that this was able and we're creating together this knowledge that might not have been there before and when you do google something wikipedia is usually it's the first thing that comes up there and so when i if you're googling a new name or place or an event or what have you and to see that come up like it it does matter like um and it, i know for me it's always the place i start to get that background knowledge and then it's a place where everything is sourced. So I'm like, oh, that I need, like, mm -hmm. that's a great source of information. Let me click that and it sends me somewhere else. And it really can be this jumping off point mm -hmm. to, to find all these new resources and people and places that you hadn't heard about before, or you didn't know about. And so I'm always, the, I always click Wikipedia first and then I'm, it's able to like bring me to all of these new places and, and what have you. And so, but to do that online with people around the world, like I, it's fascinating to me. I think it's so cool <laughs> that, and I don't know if it it could happen without this tech piece. Because in doing my research before, there's all these cool pictures of people meeting together in a room and doing that. I'm like, oh, that's so cool, and it is so cool. But there's the also you. I have to think of like, oh, well, there's a benefit to doing it this way, and that's I'm working with someone in Vancouver and New Brunswick all at the same time, just mm -hmm. at my computer. And that's, it's amazing when you think about that. I think it also, I think the pandemic has shown us that it is so easy to be socially distanced has meant that we have had to isolate a bit and that we've had to really kind of shrink our communities, our, our circles of trust. And I, I find it refreshing because as I talk to volunteers, um, they, they, they've always, you know, a few times I've heard the thing, like, it just felt great to be part of something bigger, part of something a bit more, the fact that you could make, and people make friends in these, in these communities and create lasting relationships. And it's not, I think that's the thing that people think that tech is cold and sterile, and it doesn't facilitate, yeah. it does facilitate connection. We, we it's, but it's not just like, oh, I can get, find you anywhere. I can connect with you. No, I think it's bringing people together who, you know, may have not like could be in a room and may have never talked to each other, but are really passionate once they they get into that space where they can dialogue based on the shared interest. And, you know, you think about that perspective taking, like, how do you, you know, build empathy? How do you do all of these things? And I think that can be facilitated through text. And I think that Wikipedia is this very unique experiment in which um, you, you kind of see that you kind of see people building these connections, building these relationships. And so I think one of the things that tech is like, and as you, with your, with, with your example, it's like plugged you into people. Um, now you have maybe a shared interest about contribution and, mm -hmm. you know, now this, these three people, could you come together and like, what could you facilitate together? So I think you look at, um, a tool in which you were not asked to con financially pay for anything that you can use it at your at any time um and that you could actually talk to people and say and give them kudos and say that was a great edit or you know thank you for helping me for this issue mm -hmm. yes there is there is toxicity yes there are challenges there of course but i also you know as we we strengthen how we our protect ourselves and how we become resilient online i think you still the benefit is that you are Mm -hmm. getting to know different people you are meeting different you are understanding 
you know, you're starting to learn like, oh, that doesn't translate in your language. Well, what, how could we, how could I use a word that would? Yeah. That, that conversation is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when you, you know, just an edit-a-thon, it's not just kind of being, a cre con creating and, and creating, cultivating and curating these, these, this work um, and this, the articles. I think it's also um, kind of giving people a, an opportunity to, to then say, hey, I, I want to, you know, maybe continue doing this. How can I do this? Like, can, you know, can I learn how to, to bring this to my computer, my, my community, right? And do our own edit -thon. And so I, I, I think it's just this really cool community building tool that I don't think maybe people thought would have, like, it, it just seemed like this community was this beautiful byproduct of this, of this platform, really. Um, and people have come together and they have, we have affiliates all over the world. We have user groups, we have people who, from who, around the world who come together because they care about gardening or they care about, you know, photography and, and monuments. And so it, it's just think about like, oh, I've heard people say, I have a friend in Bangladesh. I have a friend in, um, in it's Italy and I'm based in, in you know, Ecuador. And yeah. that's cool. Like, it's so crazy. That's cool. And I think, yeah, I just, I think, I don't think you would have thought that would happen because all you wanted to do one day was maybe get on Wikipedia and correct an article or write my first one myself. So, yeah. Oh, I love the way you put that. Again, so it's concise and neat. I just want to like, anyway. So, so the last question we kind of touched on already, um, but it is, we are in this global pandemic. Um, I've heard it a billion times that we are now, our lives are online and we're engaging in, socially online, professionally online, academically, really so many of our realms have just moved to online spaces. And so how do you think this has impacted um, our work, our social justice movements and things like that? And I know we've weaved that in throughout the conversation, but is there anything maybe um, else that you'd like to add to that? I think it's, I think we've started to recognize like what fatigue on being online has looked like. Um, and so that I feel has also maybe made us a little apathetic to, you know, to, to maybe the message that, oh, I'm taking in so much information that we are getting a bit desensitized to it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think I was, I had a youth workshop last week and the energy was just so low. I was like, There's, I can't, I can't teach you. I can't, we can't facilitate. Let's like talk. Let's connect yeah. in a different way. Yeah. Maybe you all just want to listen to music right now, but be together on this stage. So I think that we may see, you know, the pandemic, not slow any like slow movements or slow, um, you know, to end things. But I do think we are now having to recognize like we may need to share information differently. We mm -hmm. may need to truly unplug and it is like leave the technology somewhere and just go into a different room. Um, so I think that one of the ways I think social justice movements may be impacted by this is that, you know, we'll see those dips, those ebbs and flows of, of engagement or activity um, depending on how many more lockdowns that we go into or, you know, when the vaccine happens or and is rolled out, do we see changes in that? But I, I do think we are settling into a, a state of, of fatigued and we're zoomed out or um, and we then tend to think like, oh, I can get to that or I'll contribute yeah. to that and that tomorrow nothing is changing. And yeah. so I think we've just had to be very clear of like, okay, I know in my organizing work is just like, do we need to do a workshop every Saturday or maybe we just do one and, and yeah. it takes us four yeah. months instead of trying to get through the, like maybe we got to look at the timelines differently. Maybe we have to give <laughs> give up some things or let things go to just focus on are they even prepared or, or um, ready to engage with what we're trying to do right now I, I know I've asked my team to really think about is this really a priority right now are we are they ready to receive this or do we need to do something else or do we need to go slower um, yeah. and I, I think that's it's it's you know I never really had to face that in in you know social justice work this kind of this technologically mm -hmm. the technical fatigue or this connection fatigue or um so like it's then means that you have to to be a bit flexible i think mm -hmm. you have to be 
Um, and, and again, that's not always the case for everyone. You may not be in, in structures or organizations who can facilitate that, that kind of rethinking, that reshifting. So I also just have to be, to be honest, I, you know, I, it's sometimes harder to, to be on a call when you've been on eight calls for, for the day and then you have a friend, uh, your friends want to Zoom and then, and I'm like, well, that's a lot of time that I've sat down and made eye contact with someone and I've, you know, it, it's, I haven't really, where's the, the distinctions in my day? Like, yeah. where is like today I ended work and now I'm going into, so I, I think, um, I just really think my, my, my feet, like my response really is anchored in be kinder to yourselves and what you're doing, yeah. be flexible if you can, but also sometimes just recognizing that we we need to slow down maybe pause for a moment to ask like what do you need are you ready and if not how do we support you to get ready um especially with that justice movement stuff because yeah. i don't think i you know from just my my, my circle of pe friends and in, in, in groups mm -hmm. it's the same way you start every zoom call like yeah. pandemic we're sad or like i'm tired and yeah. And we're also doing this with children at home. We're doing this as care as, as we provide caregiving now to to families and, and communities and supporting yeah. mutual aid. So I think sometimes, um, like right now, mutual aid to me is a is a really big um, responsibility that we should be all contributing to. So mm -hmm. technology has allowed me to understand more about that and to see different types of mutual aid models to to support. So. Um, that is also something too, like maybe it's time that we explore different things now too, mm -hmm. in the ways that we support communities. So yeah, just that be, I don't, be kind, be gentle, all, all, yeah. all of the things, right? Yeah. I think yeah. life was stressful before the pet, like life is just by nature hard and stressful um, yeah. before these times and before a global pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, we're adjusting. And I know I've I've seen like the ebbs and flows or like the different like sections of the quarantine. And so how, even how my use of tech has changed. And at the beginning it was, let's Zoom all the time, friends. Let's FaceTime yeah. all the time. Like, let's, like, I need I need to see you. I need to be connected. And it's like, it was an, an overwhelming amount of wanting to do that, of the fear of like, oh my gosh, I can't see you. I have to, we still have to connect in this way. Um, and then that certainly dropped off because I think it just hit, it's like, I don't want to do one more happy hour or trivia yeah. night or things like this. It's like, I need to just stare at no screen because yeah. I, I work eight hours a day on my computer. Like, and it, I, that's really interesting where you said the, the, when did the day of work stop mm -hmm. compared to now I'm socializing because I haven't moved. I'm still sitting in front of my webcam. And so I've it's hard to make that distinction. I'm supposed to be having fun. This is my relaxing time. Yeah. But I'm still in my work chair. Like it's hard. So I it's, see that too. That's a really good thought. It's, I think it's also just like we, we physical connection is a, an important part of, mm -hmm. of our lives. And, you know, I think that part of community organizing is that you're in community, like you're around the table, you're sharing, you're eating together. And when that hap doesn't, when that's not possible, of course, technology is a tool that we can use for that connection. But we have to, it's not the same. It's, you know, I want to, I want to tact, I want to hug. I want to, I want to, you know, um, not feel like, uh, like, okay, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to be working a nine hour day because of this happy hour versus, or this. this yeah. This and I also feel like I'm not even there engaging with you. I'm like engaging with your day and I'm telling you about my day and we're not sharing. So um, one thing that I'm really, really happy that the foundation has instituted has been the our silent Fridays. So we don't do meetings. We don't do, you know, it's a really flexible model to just kind of yeah. shift that day to however you may need to, to work. So Maybe it's a, a later start, ending earlier, but it, it's that agency to decide how Friday will be shaped for you, which may help contribute to, you know, a better, you know, better mental health, better sense of self, like just also help with the things that we still have to do, like grocery shops, you know, clean and yeah. 
eat one well, like there's more I used to do but now grocery shopping and eating and cooking is pretty much yeah, that's what I, 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 I'm happy about so yeah but it's um I you know I think that technology is also a really great tool to continue to to connect even if it's yeah. hard sometimes and yeah. use to put uses you know like hey maybe no calls anymore on Fridays for us it's a yeah. boundary I'm using let's try can we try for yeah a few days so but I, I honestly haven't seen it. I haven't seen a lot of work slow down organizing wise, community like social justice wise in some sh some spheres. So I think we're also learning how to adapt to this, to this, yeah. to our technological, our technical uses, needs, and kind of what's going on around us. Yeah. Definitely shows the adaptability of humans and people mm -hmm. and the resiliency in terms of um, switching it up and finding a way that works for you in certain circumstances. And so maybe, um, it impacts one person more than the next. And so how does that, like, how do you find a way that you are going to be able to um, avoid that burnout? Because we don't know how long this is going to keep going. Yeah. Um, and so it's complicated. There's not a simple answer. It's um, a book, right? We, we've yeah. never lived through this. So we don't yeah. know how to, to do it. And I also think that's something important to hold on is like no one we know yeah. has worked <laughs> yeah. with, yeah. organized through a global pandemic where we are bombarded with the numbers, the tolls, the, the, the frustrations yeah. that, you know, so I think a lot, <laughs> the lot, and it's just, a lot. You, how do you, how do you, you know, meet every target? How do you ensure we don't, we yeah. don't. So I'm, um, thank you so much. This has been an amazing <laughs> conversation to let things out and just, <laughs> honestly that's the thing it's sometimes when you're you're able to like finally just be like it's complicated yeah. it's hard like I do that a lot with my colleagues sometimes where I'm just like it's complicated like and yeah. sometimes in, in in a perfect world and I'm someone too I just want that like nicely wrapped little box of an answer that I can open and be like ah okay that's it like let me go ahead and do that but it's not there sometimes and, and it's hard to process because I work in a way that I want, I crave that stability and answers and I want to know what's going to happen next and in a world where I can't get that for a moment. And sometimes when I think I might have a little bit of it, it's like, oh no, actually like we are staying in lockdown, but you no, it. like, it, like, yeah. like ah. so I want that nice little box of an answer, but it's sometimes just nice to be like, it's complicated. <laughs> like No answer right now. I'm working on it or just, yeah. I also just think it's, the ability to, 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 to demonstrate empathy with one another I, yeah. is important. And so sometimes like a lot of organizers that I've worked with who are really good friends of mine, you know, we would have these check-in calls where we were talking about the work that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And then one day a friend was just like, let's just actually not talk about anything. Like <laughs> what magazine, like, what are you watching? Like, what are you yeah. doing? We yes. started watching Avatar, the, the series oh, together. And we were coming together every few weeks to talk about this children's show but it's amazing we should all watch it um and i realized it's like oh my god i've known these women for so long but i've never really connected with them because we, yeah. were, we were only really connected between because of our, our work that we were doing and so now we i think one of the i look at that group of people and i'm like oh my god i like they are really good friends of mine and I feel them, I feel like I know them more. So I think just even like, you know, reframing and, and empathizing with the fact like if we don't know the answers, maybe we just change up what we're doing right now. Yeah. Maybe we just like pause that for a moment and being receptive to, to having people be receptive to that and not feel judged to, to say that and voice that. I think that has also been something that I've had to come to terms with that, you know what, sometimes the agenda is not important. Sometimes it's just the, the connection at this point in time and giving people what they need and getting what you need as well. I just, I'm like wanting to write them down so I can frame these quotes and like put them all over my workspace as a constant reminder. Simona told me I have to, it's, because honestly, it's, it's nice to hear it. It's refreshing. And it's sometimes we do need that reminder of these things. Um, because we get lost in the one call to the next call to the next call. And I lost the Zoom link. There's a million Zoom links. Like exactly. Right and I just, yeah. So I think we have to just be, 
I think we've all heard this be gentle with one ourselves, but I think we really just need to be gentle and demonstrate that. And so I know in my role as a manager, what, I, you know, I, you do set the pace sometimes, you do set the example. And so honoring Silent Fridays has been the way I've been doing that. I won't book meetings, I won't take meetings from my staff. Um, I won't even just be on email. Sometimes I need to think, sometimes I need to post it notes, sometimes I need to draft it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they, you know, I'm hoping that that sets an example for them that yeah. they don't have to That's operate on that, that level. But I think I also am really fortunate to work for an organization that has mm -hmm. understood, mm -hmm. um, that it's not going to be business as usual, that we do need to make some, some amendments to, to yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you so much for no this today, for joining me, um, for celebrating International Women's Day with me. My favorite day of the year, mind you, International Women's Day is pretty much, a, I have a, 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 like a little tradition with my best, like absolute best friend. And we come together, we cake together, we look like just love on each other and just share why we, you know, the ability to connect with one yeah. another and like why that's so important. So I so love happy. It. Yeah. We're celebrating International Women's Day. We're ending our edit a thon. Like, this is like the day of, like, oh my gosh, it's a very exciting day. Um, and you shared so many incredible things. Again, I feel like I'm going to go back and watch this a million times so I can, like, write things out um, and frame them. Um, but it's, it's really important as we continue to move through this pandemic because we don't know what things are going to be like and when. Yeah. The out of the, we just don't know and so how we continue to engage in online spaces and use technology as a tool as we were talking about and having conversations about digital literacy we were able to touch on so many important topics and again they're huge but I think we were able to really kind of get in there a little bit um and so thank you. I want to say for those watching that you can check out our social media at YWC Canada. If you're interested in the edit-a-thon, we've been posting a lot of resources, um, really cool updates, articles, all just so many things, but also updates about what we were able to do um, as part of our edit-a-thon and the pages we created and the edits that we were able to do. Um, so I want to encourage you to go check that out as well. And thank you so much for joining us today. This was, again, incredible. I really appreciate it, Simona. Um, awesome. And happy International Women's Day. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too, and happy International Women's Day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Rafa.